Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to talk to John Strelecki, the author of The Big Five for Life. It's going to be very interesting, so don't miss it. Hey John, thank you very much for joining our show today. Um, this is John Strelecki, um, the author of The Big Five for Life, a book that I read quite recently and I got very much passionate about. So it's very much an honor to have you today here and to be able to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Appreciate the opportunity. Sure. Um, so I don't want to waste much of your time. And I think the audience is also very excited to, to hear and learn from you. Um, but first of all, could you please give us a very quick summary of your book, maybe in a few sentences? What is the book about? Uh, yeah, it's about a man named Thomas Durrell. And uh, the story is told from the perspective of his protege, uh, who is also his best friend. And in the opening pages of the book, we learn that Thomas, a man who people love and who is very successful in the things that he does, um, we learn that he's dying. And over the course of the 250 pages, we come to really love him and everything that he stands for and the way that he leads, and then he dies. So it's a, it's a very emotional story. Um, it's set in the context of leadership and business, um, but it's also a story about life. Mm -hmm. So until, I don't know, until page 100 or so, I believe that this is your personal story, or at least a real story. And then I figured it, it isn't. Um, did you have any happenings in your personal life, maybe, that helped you come up with this very concept and also with the example ex examples explained? Yeah, so the character of Thomas is uh, what's called an aggregate character. And so there was no one individual that really personified everything that I wanted to talk about in the story, including the aspect of mortality. Um, and so I took the stories of three, di <clears throat> excuse me, three different people in my life and blended different parts of their stories into one person, and that was Thomas. Um, interestingly, the if you've read The Big Five for Life Continued, which is the sequel book, in there I talk about a company called DLGL, and in getting to know the leader there, Jacques Gannett, the parallels between his actual life and his business partner um, and what I talked about in The Big Five for Life were unbelievable, including the fact that his business partner passed away at 55 years of age. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, sometimes it's a leaping off point to something else, and that was the case with the sequel book, yeah. I see, I see. Well, um, so within the book, you differentiate between two different concepts. Uh, the one is the purpose for existing, and the yeah. other is as the book's headline, The Big Five for Life. Uh, could right. you maybe differentiate both of them, um, and also maybe give an example? Sure, yeah, so I tend to think of these things in a visual format, it's easier for my brain to process. So for me, your PFE, which stands for your purpose for existing, it's the answer to the question, why am I here, which I raised in the first book I wrote called Das Café I'm Run to Develop. That is, uh, think of that as a river. And so as you are floating down the river of life, the question is, well, what are you doing with your life? You know, And, and maybe you decide that your, your purpose for existing is to make a difference in the lives of others. And so that's your river. You're on the make a difference river. And the question is, okay, that's awesome. And now what are you going to do while you're on that river? And I think of those as ports of call. And so which stops are you going to stop at as you're floating down the river? Maybe you decide, I want to be an amazing leader. I want to start a startup company and create an amazing culture and give people the chance to work on something they're passionate about. And that might be one of your ports of call on the make a difference river. Uh, maybe you decide, you know what, in addition to that, I'm also super passionate about wildlife preservation. And so I also um, want to create some sort of philanthropic venture where people can go experience animals in the wild. And that's part of my make a difference contribution as well. So that's another port of call. So each of these main five ports of call are your big five for life. These are the things that you most want to do, see or experience in your lifetime before you die. I see, I see. Is there some kind of way how you can accelerate this finding process? Well, everybody's uh, adventure is a bit different. And so for me, it was a year of backpacking around the world when I was in my early 30s that really helped crystallize for me what my purpose was and the things that I wanted to do to your experience. So that's certainly one possibility. And I met many other people who have done extended travels like that. Uh, and I know that you're a traveler from our discussion offline. And so that's an awesome way. Um, I, over the years, I had many, many people asking me after having read the book, can you help me? And yeah. so I ended up creating an experience that people can go through and it takes about two days. 
And through that experience, they can become aware of what their personal big five for life are. So that's more of the accelerated path. Um, but everybody's everybody's adventure is a bit different. So I always like to say there is no one way. There are certainly options such as the two-day experience or again, backpacking around the world or maybe sailing around the world for six months might be somebody's ideal. Cool. So uh, as we get older as people and more experienced, we, we, we change and also our personality. Is it possible that our purpose for existing and the big fives uh, also change or are they kind of set in stone? I think one of the wonderful things about life is that very little is set in stone. And yeah. so as you evolve as a human being, as we grow, it's constantly worth reevaluating. Am I still interested in floating this river or maybe I'm more called to go to a different river? I think for the most part, your purpose at its core will probably stay very similar. You may change some of the wording behind it and how you describe it to yourself and others, but probably the essence is very tied to who and what you are at a, v a very deep internal level. Um, your big five for life, you know, once you've done, seen or experienced one of them, if it's something that's kind of a one-time shot, maybe you say, I, I want to go on safari in Africa. Mm -hmm. And so once you've done that, you may decide, oh, all right, so now that I've done that, I want to add something else to my list. And so some things are done, move off the list and other new things come on. But the key thing is that it's about starting with the five most important things to you, um, because it's very easy in life to get um, the brain satisfaction, the dopamine fix of checking something off on the to-do list. But yeah. at the end of the day, it's not about doing the easy things. It's about doing the things that really matter to us during our days. Mm -hmm. I see. So, John, recently when I was uh, one year younger, when I was 27, I became a university lecturer for the first time. And my students back then were just like 10 years younger than me. Yeah. Um, and I don't only want to teach them about digitization, I also try to teach them about life and personality and how to be a good person. Um, so what advice would you give, especially young people who don't even really know what's out there? How, how, could, how can they find their purpose and, and their big fives? Because I remember when I was a little boy, I wanted to become a policeman um, because yeah. I didn't even know what's out there. So how, how can you imagine that? Yeah, it's interesting. I find about 30% of younger people have pretty much locked into what they want. And they're very clear on that. 70% um, they don't know. I was in the category of I didn't know when yeah. I was in that age group. And so there's a couple things. I, I, so we've had people uh, as young as in their late teens, early 20s go through the two day experience. And so again, that certainly is one way to do it. Um, I highly recommend if they have the bandwidth, the flexibility, the courage to to go travel because travel opens up your mind in ways that almost nothing else in the life experience can do. And so, you know, you're going to work for the majority of your adult life. And uh, it's awesome to, if you're done with school or you're, you know, you're between that gap and you're also going to have a whole new level of self-confidence. And to me, making the decision you're talking about is actually a self-confidence question because most people will tell you, well, these are the these are the industries where there's a lot of jobs or here's what the jobs in this industry are paying. That's good. I mean, you want to be able to get a job and, and you want to be paid an appropriate wage so that you can live the life that you want to live. But what I've discovered in life is that if you're really passionate about what you do and you're really good at what you do, the money follows. And so it's less about, oh, making sure that I pick a job where there's a lot of you know, a lot of people are requesting that type of skill set. It's more about being the best at what you do and being the best because you're passionate about it and then understanding the money piece. And then, the, like I said, the money will follow. So my advice to a young person has been and always will be map out what you'd really like to do with your life and what you're excited about learning about, you know, because so much of learning is, oh, I have to get this done for the test. And I totally was like that when I was in school. But ideally, learning is supposed to be I am so excited to learn about this because I genuinely want to know more about it. And if you can art, if you can align that sort of philosophy with your educational experience, you're going to be 20 steps ahead. Fantastic. Yeah. I'll make sure I'll, I'll forward it to my students. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, so, but, but well, what if you are very fortunate and if you have already reached your big five at a very young age, what, what's after that? Yeah. So uh, if, if you have the awareness of your personal big five for life and you're actively in the process of living those, mm -hmm. 
then I find that what happens is something I talk about in the Big Five for Life book. You experience what's called this ascending life curve. And so every life has highs and has lows. But for the most part, people, their highs are about the same high, their lows are about the same ho and low, and they, they just kind of go like this over the course of their life. But when you're living in alignment with your Big Five for Life, it's actually an ascending curve. And what's cool about that visually is that at some point, although you still have highs and lows, your lows are now higher than what used to be your highs. And I find this to be the case with the situation that you're describing. And so maybe at the start, your big five for life are, um, you want to, I don't know, wh oh, start your first company or you want to enter a good relationship, you know? And so after you've started your first company and that was a success or a failure, but you learned something in the process, then you can say, oh, you know what? I don't wanna just start my first company. I want to do this. And so the size of the dream can expand, uh, but it can't expand until you take those first steps and try these things out. So for the most part, people go through the first round of their big five for life, and they love it so much that they add on another round of big five for life, and that curve just continues to climb. See, I see, makes sense. So within the book, you often talk about leadership and culture within companies. Um, can you maybe give us a case study or something where you describe an existing company that has already implemented your concept? Is this a company like that out there? Yeah, so there's a lot of them out there. Um, the one that I know, <clears throat> excuse me, the best because I worked with them for two years is a company called DLGL uh, based uh, just outside of Montreal. So the Big Five for Life sequel book tells the story of DLGL. And uh, they are an amazing company. They have been around for over 25 years. And they are very, they were cutting edge before the term cutting edge was even thought about in terms of what they did for their people, the way they treat their people. Um, they have no sick time policy. They have no vacation policy. The policy is take as much as you need. Uh, when they have people who have experienced a major illness, either themselves or someone in their family, think of how that plays out. You know, so I remember a distinct story in talking with Jacques Annette, the CEO of that company. And he said someone in the company, their wife had cancer. And so this person came to them and told them, and Jacques said, go be with her, you know? And he explained to me that, yeah, as an employer, as a CEO, you could tell someone, well, no, I'm expecting you to do both things, but you know, they're going to be useless to their spouse at the hospital because they're going to be tired from a day at work. They're going to be useless to us at work because they're tired of being, you know, front at the hospital. He said, that's not the ideal. He said, so we tell them, take as much time as you need. And when you're ready, come back. And he said, the wonderful thing that happens from that, of course, is when they come back, like they're incredibly grateful. And so their commitment to the organization is even at an unbelievably higher level. And the other thing he said is that everybody in the organization sees that. And they know that if that's ever me, I know that this company has my back and has the back of my family. Mm -hmm. And he said, and that just makes people even more dedicated to the organization. So it may look like a short term loss if you're evaluating your results on a Q1, Q2 basis. But he has a very long-term perspective in the way that he runs his company. Uh, and so he sees it as a lifetime experience for these people. And that's why it's, it's a total game changer for him. His take is when he hires someone, he actually says this to people. He says, we, when we're hiring people, he says, we're looking for someone who's interested in coming here to die. <laughs> and they sort of laugh. And they're like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> But the essence of it is that we're not just hiring people to take a job. We're inviting them to become part of a family. And we expect that it's going to be such a great experience on both sides that you'll want to stay here for a long, long time. I like your example. Um, yeah. Have they implemented it from the very beginning or have they already had legacy and a traditional culture and implemented it afterwards? Yeah, um, the second. And the cool thing about that is one of the things that I've discovered in life is uh, many great leaders uh, who have read the Big Five for Life book and who have contacted me when I've engaged in a conversation with them. They've said something to the effect of, this is the kind of book I would write if I was an author. Like, these are the principles that I believe in. These are the ways that I treat my people. I just never thought of them in the context of something like Museum Day before. Um, but I, I love the, the way in which that connects, because, for example, at DLGL, uh, Museum Day, that term Museum Day is now part of their everyday vernacular. Um, when Jacques sends a message to his people, he says, make it a great Museum Day. So here's an amazing company, an amazing leader, an amazing group of people. And we were able to collaborate on something and it raised both of us. And that's, I think, 
what I love about the interaction with great leaders in the Big Five for Life book. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, so I work with uh, the German middle stunt companies, the medium sized companies quite a lot. And yeah. I can very easily imagine if uh, an executive came in in the morning and now behave very different differently. I'm, I'm just wondering, do the people take this person seriously or do they make fun behind them? Um, so how do you really implement it in a way that uh, people follow you, you and and also be very open because in the book, you, you described that people have their big fives at the back of their business card. So they, they share it within a very traditional culture. How do you do that? So I'll tell you some examples of companies that have done it in ways that I think are really cool and uh, two immediately come to mind. One is a company that is uh, a mid-size like you're talking about <clears throat> in the printing space, printing and paper space. And they, they evolved their company based on service. And so in an industry where everybody else is competing on price, they said, that's not us. Uh, we're going to compete on service. And so they're very passionate about making sure that their customer experience is the best in the industry. And so they got very excited about the Big Five for Life concept. They got copies of the book for all of the people in the company. And then the, the leader of the company had each person, uh, each person's Big Five for Life framed. And so on the top, it says their name and their PFE and then their Big Five for Life. And this went up in the company in a common area. And so when people had time off, they would look at it and they would get to know each other as human beings, not just as, oh, that's, you know, Daniel in accounting or that's Mary and she works in, uh, you know, human resources or, um, you know, that's Tanya and she's in the sales department. Now they got to know each other as real human beings. What are their big five for life? What matters to them? And uh, it was amazing the way in which this even further connected the people in the organization. They were connected around the purpose, which was great customer service in their industry. But now they became real connected as human beings and it just made the company that much stronger and that much more successful. Um, another example, this is more of a smaller organization. They think they had about 14 or 15 people in the telecom space. And so she, same thing, had gotten the Big Five for Life book and gave it to each of her people. And then she said, you know, one of the things I want to do as an organization is I want you to have the freedom to design your office in a way that makes you feel the best every day. And so each person figured out, well, you know what, this is what I'm excited about. So one guy is a huge hockey fan. And so he designed his whole office around the theme of hockey. Another one is a huge Star Wars fan. Yeah. And uh, so this small little transition, this small little change, she said, did wonders for the way in which, like now people were like excited to come to work and sit at their desk and in their office. And mm -hmm. then for the Christmas bonuses, instead of just giving people something, she gave them something that was directly related to their big five for life. And she said it was unbelievable because it was stuff that they really would have loved, but they probably wouldn't have spent the money on for themselves. Like one guy was a huge skier. And mm -hmm. so she got him a, I can't remember the term, but it's like a universal ski pass. You can go anywhere in the country at these best ski slopes. And she said, this was just like the best gift ever for this young guy. And he never would have spent that money on himself. Yeah. And so these are just some, you know, just a few of the hundreds of examples that I've seen over the years of creative leadership employing the concept of the big five for life in a way that brings it home for the organization. So, you know, my take is one is very simple. If you as an executive, if you have the leader of the company are passionate about it and you articulate why you're passionate about it, if somebody in the organization doesn't buy into that, then you as the leader have to ask yourself, is that the right person for the organization? Mm. I mean, and the answer is no, it's not. You can give them time to sort of embrace it or get to know it. But at the end of the day, you know, I'll tell you another example in the expression that really captures this. So in the public sector, I worked with a leader and she totally transformed an organization again on service. So an organization that does things like parking tickets, um, evictions, not the kind of thing that you would expect great service scores on. And she won the equivalent of like the Ritz Carlton for customer service. If you can understand, I mean, that's right. unbelievable, right? And she said her philosophy was, we'll help you be happy either here or somewhere else. Because if, if what we're doing does not fit in with your personality, we understand that, but you can't stay here. We'll help you be happy somewhere else. We'll help you find a new job somewhere other other another company, but this yeah. is not the right home for you. Yeah. Thank you for the explanation. Makes sense. Um, yeah. Started our conversation 
uh, from a personal or individual point of view. Then we moved on to the business perspective. And I would like to end our conversation also with an individual question. Um, sure. I, I see a lot of people being afraid of pursuing their dreams. Um, they would love to do something, but something in their mind tells them better don't because if you fail, everyone will laugh about you and you will be embarrassed. Yeah. So how do you help those kinds of people really stick to what, what they really say and to execute what they want to do and, and really achieve their dreams? Yeah, so a couple of things immediately leap to mind for that. The first is so many times I see people get caught in what I describe in the book as uh, mad how disease. And so it's uh, this question of, well, how do I do that? And how do I do this? And so they have a perspective on the dream. Maybe it's being an entrepreneur. Yeah. And uh, then they get caught in, well, how do I do that? But the question is never how. Um, that question just leads to barriers and obstacles and, and points of failure. So the much better question is who? Who's already doing it? Who's already done, seen, and experienced what I want to do, see, ex and experience? And if we study the people who have done, seen, and experienced what we want to, and we study successful people, and that's a critical part of that formula, then the odds are that our rate of success goes up dramatically. And the reason I focus so much on that study, the people who are successful, is because it's amazing to me how many times people have a dream but they talk to other people about the dream, but the people they're talking to are not successful in that arena. And so, you know, if your dream is to be an entrepreneur and you're talking to people who have never tried entrepreneurship, what are the odds that you're going to get great advice? I mean, they might be excited for you and hopefully they're supportive, but they don't have the expertise that you need at that moment. But if you get online and you study examples of people who have launched businesses successfully, or you do what you did for me. You reached out and you said, hey, I'd love to do an interview, right? Talk to people who are successfully doing businesses. Now, all of a sudden, you're occupying a framework of success and the odds of your success go up dramatically when that is the path that you're choosing. Yeah. I would also say one other thing, which is uh, one of the core things I, I've been teaching for years as it relates to helping people implement their big five for life is sampling. So the brain doesn't want to change. The brain wants to do today what it did yesterday. And so the way that you can help the brain get beyond this issue that it has is by slowly sampling. And so maybe if someone says, I want to be an entrepreneur, I say, you know what, fine. So for this week, five minutes a day, I want you to study something about entrepreneurship. Just five minutes a day, no more. You cannot study that sixth minute, right? And so at the end of the week, they come back to me. I said, well, you know, what'd you do? What'd you study? Oh, I got on YouTube. I was watching this great video by, uh, you know, uh, some of these great entrepreneurs of the world, Richard Branson. I watched a five minute video on Richard Branson, right? And I said, well, was it five minutes or was it six? No, you told me just five. I only watched five minutes, right? And uh, so at the end of the day, I said, well, what was that like? And I said, well, I'd really like to watch the end of that video. You know, what, five minutes. I'll tell you what, this, this week, I'll give you 10 minutes. Well, Daniel, what happens is now you start moving the brain into the category where it is demanding more information. Instead of it being afraid, now mm. it craves the information. That's a much better system. And so by sampling and starting small, you can create a demand system from your brain instead of a fear system. And that is way more effective. Wow, I love it. Yeah. Great. Um, John, yeah, thanks again. Um, to be very frank with you, I was borrowed this book by a very good friend um, and I will make sure many, many people in my close circle of friends will also receive this book as a gift from me. Um, yeah, you, that, you is the, that is the highest compliment possible for an author when someone shares it with someone they care about. So I greatly appreciate that. And please thank your friend who shared it with you. I will. I will. Yeah. So thanks again, John, for your great insights. This was a big pleasure for me. Um, and hopefully we'll meet soon in Germany when you next time over here. I look forward to it. Thank you very much. I appreciate Thank it. You. Have a great one. Take care. Bye-bye.